Hi, good morning or good afternoon. This is Erin Brahmanjan. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today for a conversation centered on a recently published report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine entitled Strengthening Sustainability Programs and Curricula at the Undergraduate and Graduate Level. Uh, my name is Erin Brahmanjan, and I'm the Director of Olympic and Paralympic Development and the Conrad and Hilton Foundation Fellow on the Sustainable Development Goals in the Office of the Mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. And I'm proud to have served as a member of the committee that prepared this consensus report. I'm joined by several of my colleagues from the committee and from the National Academy today. I'd like to take a moment and let them introduce themselves to all of you. Anne, why don't you start? Hello, everybody. I'm Ann Kapuscinski. I'm a professor of environmental studies and also the director of the Coastal Science and Policy Program, which focuses on coastal sustainability problem solving at UC Santa Cruz. And I had the tremendous honor and delight of chairing uh, the committee that produced this report. Um, it was a wonderful experience working with extremely dedicated and talented group of people. Thanks, Dan. Let's go to Arun. Hi. Hi, I'm Arun Agarwal, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this session. And I'm really looking forward to uh, the discussion and to hearing your questions and to talking with you about our report and its findings. I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan's School for Environment and Sustainability. Thanks, Arun. Lita? Hello, my name is Lita Benenson. I am a senior program officer at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, working in the Division of Policy and Global Affairs, as well as the Division for Engineering and Physical Sciences. I had the great privilege of being the study director for uh, this study at the National Academies, um, and we look forward to answering your questions about strengthening sustainability in higher education. And I want to say hi to Emi Kamiyama. Emi, do you want to say hi? Yes, thank you so much, Erin. I'm Emi Kamiyama, also staff for the National Academy of Sciences. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emi. So I'm going to pass it back over to our chair, Dr. Kapuczynski, to give us a little overview of the study. Um, but before I do, I just want to acknowledge the other members of the committee that aren't with us today on this panel. Uh, Dr. Garrick Louis, the University of Virginia, Dr. Dorsita Taylor at Yale University, and Dr. Christopher Boone of Arizona State University. Thanks to all of them as well. Anne, over to you. Thank you. And I'll try to keep this short uh, since we did have a, a pre recorded video that covered this, but just to refresh everybody's minds. The, this committee was given a charge that had five parts to it, uh, but in a nutshell, the charge was to look at the the burgeoning flourishing of sustainability programs around the country and around the world, and to identify opportunities for strengthening these programs, both in terms of uh, their competencies, uh, in terms of being able to connect with the sustainable development goals and other frameworks that are out there uh, to improve uh, interactions between uh, programs at universities and higher education institutions and uh, the workforce and other kinds of partners, uh, essentially to be able to form um, more effective partnerships and also to discuss research agendas related to better understanding actually how sustainability and higher education programs are um, affecting education, uh, affecting the students' career options and affecting the workforce. So to address this charge, we took a three-part approach. First, we hosted three workshops for public input on the study charge. We felt this was very important because there really is a diversity of stakeholders who care and are excited about sustainability and higher education programs. And we made a special point of including representatives of the workforce because ultimately this is where our graduates from these interdisciplinary sustainability programs are going. And we knew that there's a lot of activity and interest in the workforce. And we were interested in improving the connection between what the workforce employers are looking for and what our programs um, in higher institutions are doing. Secondly, our, the project staff, as well as our committee examined relevant research and data uh, on workforce research and curricular needs and sustainability. 
And finally, committee members spoke with congressional staffers to understand current legislative efforts uh, on sustainability education. We ended up with recommendations under three principal themes. So I'll just present the themes, won't go into the recommendations right now. The first theme was strengthening sustainably educational programs at undergraduate and graduate levels. So that, for example, looked at issues such as uh, core competencies. We added stuff about context. Um, we emphasized the importance of improving diversity, equity, and inclusion, both in the makeup, the composition of the student body and the faculty and uh, the content of the curriculum. Our second theme was building the academic environment for sustainably in higher education institutions. As you can imagine, this looked at things like the importance of leadership at the top and ways that interdisciplinarity can be encouraged and fostered. And third uh, theme was developing a sustainably workforce to understand and address current and future sustainability challenges. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Erin. Thanks, Anne. So we do have the opportunity to take questions live. Um, and if you could post them in the Slido channel, I believe that the link is available to all of you if you've registered and are familiar with the Slido uh, app. So if you can post questions into the Slido, I'll be able to retrieve them there and post them back to our panel. But let me go ahead and start and tee it up with a quick question to you, Arun. And I'm going to ask what collectively, what actions and steps can be taken by the higher education community to promote funding for research and to assess the marketplace for sustainability jobs in the future? Because that was a key part of our research agenda as one of the findings of the report. Yeah, that's a great uh, question. Uh, and and uh, I'll be happy to try to answer that. Although I should say that all the committee members have our views on it. and. Uh, we had extensive and very productive and generative discussions during a whole series of meetings that we held as a committee, both with people who were in the, in the uh, corporate and in the NGO sector, who were in higher education, who were in uh, a number of different government agencies to try to assess what they thought would be the right base for us to recommend for going about strengthening the uh, uh, sustainability related uh, offerings in higher education and how to build a stronger community of those who are working on sustainability issues in higher education. And while there are a few things that I want to highlight from this discussion, uh, it is something that we are still learning about. And I want to say, uh, we are also looking for your feedback and your suggestions to us because uh, sustainability as a field is still quite a new field and it is still very much in the process of formation, which is precisely why the National Academies uh, 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 created our committee and asked us to provide some uh, recommendations around how to strengthen the field. So an obvious mechanism for strengthening the field of sustainability and strengthening uh, curricular offerings in higher education and sustainability is federal support. Uh, uh, such support has been low to uh, uh, zero to low for a very long time. And I think much of the work on sustainability that is happening is happening through the distributed efforts of both who are in the field and of companies and of government agencies, but there isn't a coordinated policy from the federal government that would provide a clear sense of the resources and the directions relevant for pursuing higher education sustainability goals, uh, especially for programs and institutions where such uh, programs are not present, or especially for young programs and institutions where such programs are not present. Uh, we also made a number of uh, recommendations around coordination across some of the major programs that are currently serving students. Uh, a number of universities have launched sustainability related programs that are new. A number of them have older offerings which have been transformed into sustainability oriented curricula and uh, more coordination across these programs, uh, both across the major schools that have such programs, but also new programs is a critical need for improved and more coordinated connections across programs and for students and employers both to have a clearer sense of what it is that sustainability graduates learn when they uh, come out of these programs. Uh, we have a lot of different examples of how such coordination has happened in the past. 
across uh, other uh, fields, uh, professional fields, so we can learn from them for sure. But uh, such a coordination would be very useful for us to think about the community of scholars and educators, employers and learners who are invested in sustainability, and more importantly, who want to work on making our world a more sustainable place. Uh, so let me stop there, Erin, uh, 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 and uh, uh, if there are other thoughts that panel members have, uh, I would invite you to share those as well. Thanks, Sabrun. I'm going to actually pass the floor to Lita and ask her kind of a follow-up question. Just okay. a reminder to everyone watching, like you can post questions in the Slido app. Please do. We'll be ready to take them live. Lita, my question to you is, um, and you can speak specifically to the report as well as your experience at NASM, how should widely held norms related to sustainability, issues like equity and social and economic and environmental justice, as well as democratic action, how could those be better incorporated into sustainability programs? Yeah, thank you so much, Erin. And I think that's such a, it's a very timely question. Um, as well. And, and while it wasn't explicitly stated in our statement of task for the study to focus on issues around um, equity and environmental and um, economic and social justice, the committee, I think, realized immediately, and this was even before the pandemic hit and before the Black Lives Matter events hit, that strengthening any sustainability program is going to need to address these issues around equity, inclusion, diversity, and, and social justice. And, and the committee actually laid out a lot of ideas on how to better incorporate these principles into sustainability programs uh, across multiple levels. And so at one level, um, it's incredibly important to um, prioritize attracting students from various backgrounds into sustainability programs. Um, and while the report isn't necessarily prescriptive about it, I think that there is a lot of research um, out there in higher education in general, especially around higher education and STEM fields about um, ways to engage uh, students at the high school level and early college years um, to, to sort of engage them and, and bring them into some of these programs where they are underrepresented. Um, but even from there, they need um, diverse faculty or faculty who are going to prioritize um, and pay special attention to issues around equity and inclusion and even the local and indigenous culture uh, of their community. Um, and it needs to be a part of their, their own curricula um, as well as you know, just a, a part of the sustainability programs as well. Really important to this idea of making sure that these are inclusive um, educational experiences within the sustainability programs. The, the committee um, recognized the importance of um, sort of field experiences or being able to get sort of real world experiences um, during their sustainability education. And, and what we know from the research is that you can't expect students to be able to engage in these um, experiential learning opportunities if they have to pay for them or if they're expected to do them for free or without resources. And so the committee um, recognized the fact that um, already a lot of students are going to not be able to access um, these experiential learning opportunities if there isn't attention and resources put in place to provide them to the students. And so we were lucky that during um, some of our workshops, we were able to hear a little bit about some of the different sort of programs across the country that were trying to get students involved in their local community in an experiential way. And there was definitely a lot of agreement that it strengthened the experience of the students within those programs as well. And so that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg about these principles and, and equity and, and social, economic, environmental justice that are in the report. And, and I really do urge um, you know, the viewers out there to take a look at the report, which is freely available uh, on National Academies Press um, to really dig into those uh, recommendations. But thank you. Thanks, Lita. I think following on to that topic and kind of how we integrate some of these uh, key priorities for our world right into the sustainability curriculum program. Um, I want to talk now to Anne and uh, to our chair, Dr. Kapuscinski. You, I know, have a passion in this space and are really doing a lot of work on this. So let me ask you specifically, we talk in the report about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a kind of key fabric, as Lita brought up, right? Key fabric of the institutions and like sustainability programs. But what can also be done to strengthen existing programs at minority serving institutions and expand them across, you know, to, to really better interact with uh, 
with non-MSI specific institutions? Uh, that's a great question, Erin. Uh, obviously, one of the strengths of MSIs is that their uh, student population is already um, and happily dominated by um, the students who have been historically underrepresented in STEM fields in um, white dominant uh, institutions. And they also tend to have um, more diverse faculty. So that's a real strength, uh, which I think positions them to become actually real leaders in this area. So, you know, the first thing I would say is I would want to echo what Lita was talking about these institutions just need more financial support um, to be able to build out their sustainability work and really take advantage of the comparative strength that they have, um, which is this rich diversity and inclusion that they've already got. And you know, although we don't say this explicitly in the report, I, I'll just personally say that I, I hope that foundations and donors um, as well as government programs will step up and see that this is a huge opportunity especially at this national and increasingly international moment um, of racial reckoning. And, you know, I think uh, overdue commitment um, to much greater uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, secondly, uh, anything that can be done, well, first of all, I think these, these MSIs are probably already doing this, but I would, I would want to encourage them to actively draw on uh, indigenous knowledge, traditional economic knowledge, knowledge from the cultures that are more that are better represented in their student and faculty populations, because there is so much rich, uh, often centuries, if not thousands of years of experience of actually sustainable practices, and also ways of thinking sort of fr conceptual frameworks for sustainability that have been, I think, under um, under discussed and under taught um, in the white dominant institutions. So I think that the MSIs are well positioned to do that and should, should really um, go as far as they can with that because I think that's gonna add, um, again, strength to the overall body of knowledge and the overall capacity of our society to actually transition to sustainability, which we know is a huge challenge and the challenge is getting harder over time um, with problems such as the, the climate um, crisis. Uh, and then the third thing is uh, we should be looking for opportunities for truly mutually beneficial collaborations and interactions between MSIs and the white dominant institutions. Um, and, in, and doing it in ways that does not sort of rob the students from the MSIs to come to the other universities. Uh, and, you know, I think there are a few examples of this, but to the extent that, again, even programs like NSF that I know support some, they have, for example, this includes grant program to the extent that they can actually support uh, meaningful, mutually beneficial interactions and collaborations. They could be everything from student exchanges, even like through summer practicum experiences, which it could include working together on experiential learning in communities and in the private sector and in government. It could be faculty exchanges. Uh, I would like to see um, a lot more of that. We again hinted at that um, in the report, um, um, didn't go into a lot of depth about it. I would like to add though that uh, because of the interest in, in this particular issue in our report, as well as some other issues, um, our members of our committee are actively now working on follow-up papers to actually develop these ideas further um, and including, I'm leading um, a paper on deepening, uh, it's gonna be a review paper on deepening justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in sustainably higher education programs. That's a great segue, Anne. So I'm actually going to turn that to, uh, to Arun now and ask, you know, in the, in the report, we identified as part of the research agenda, a need to better explore how we're defining sustainability jobs in effect. Like, what is the marketplace? How is it evolving? Where is it going? And I know that you've done some research into this and are continuing to do some. I wonder if you could share with us kind of what we, what we, what we included in the report and, and where you're seeing that evolve now. Yeah, I, I think the what there are maybe three uh, top level takeaways about uh, sustainability jobs and what is happening to them. Uh, one, the the field of sustainability is diffuse, and jobs for sustainability are spread out very widely across the entire spectrum of uh, market, government, and civil society sectors. Uh, and even within, and perhaps the largest numbers of jobs 
for working on sustainability issues is in the is in the private sector, not so much in not as much in the government or in the NGO sector. And uh, we we find, and this is partly uh, just based on experience, but partly also what we find is that uh, all so many of the larger companies are now beginning to hire uh, uh, professionals who are focusing on sustainability and on incorporating sustainability in their operations, in their marketing, in their uh, in the whole range of their activities. But obviously, sustainability jobs in government and in the and in civil society organizations are another major area of uh, uh, that we that uh, uh, higher education institutions can target for the students and students can target themselves. So that's the first point that uh, jobs and sustainability are uh, highly diffuse and very spread out. Uh, the second point to note is that the number of jobs in sustainability is large and it is increasing. Uh, and uh, we, we, say, I, we say this on the basis of just doing some very quick surveys, a very quick uh, assessment of the, uh, uh, of, of the jobs for sustainability advertised on, uh, on different job uh, sites and in, uh, in, the, in the US government uh, uh, reports on employment. And we see that the number of jobs that we can think of as, sustain as about being about sustainability is increasing. And they have continued to increase consistently over the last uh, decade. Uh, the third thing I would say is that we don't have precise numbers of uh, uh, that we can say are the numbers of jobs available for sustainability. At a very rough estimate, these numbers uh, can vary, uh, maybe 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 uh, varied as uh, in a range that goes as uh, from something like uh, fifty to sixty thousand jobs per year, new jobs per year, to one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand new jobs in sustainability. And partly it is about thinking of what counts as a sustainability job. So for many of the jobs that uh, that are relevant to graduates from higher education institutions who work on sustainability issues, many of them may not be defined uh, with the term sustainability in them. Uh, nonetheless, they are jobs about sustainability when they are talking about uh, a more efficient use of resources or inputs that go into production, uh, 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 be, uh, better communications uh, by different organizations about what they are doing uh, to serve the planet or to protect the planet. So there's a whole range of ways in which jobs on sustainability are being defined. Uh, and, what, so, and this also brings me to the question of what we need to do to get a better sense of what what kinds of jobs there are and uh, how to estimate the number of jobs that exist. So there are two major ways in which we can do that. And some of that is already being done primarily through, and one of those primarily through the, uh, the first way, which is to undertake surveys of organizations that are hiring in the fields of sustainability. And these surveys are being carried out both by researchers and by uh, uh, higher education institutions whose graduates are being trained for jobs and sustainability. The second way would be to look at the range of jobs that are being advertised and identify those which mention or which include different types of skills that are related to sustainability or different keywords related to sustainability. And some of some work that we are doing right now is looking exactly at the second strategy for uh, doing a comprehensive assessment of the breadth of the jobs in the field of sustainability and the numbers of jobs that are there in this field in, in this field for different kinds of skills that employers or uh, uh, organizations want from those who hire uh, those who are hired in these jobs and finally also how these numbers are changing or how they have changed over the last uh, decade or so Thanks, Arun. I think that that is, again, like a great transition to ask Anne a question about competencies, which was a key kind of anchor of this report. And the reason I want to raise that now is because in talking about the marketplace for sustainability careers and even trying to define that and scope it, we see that there is a breadth of knowledge required, as well as some depth, as well as a host of, I don't want to call them soft skills, because they're certainly not soft, but real capacities that are out there as well. So Anne, could you speak to that and the findings of the report on competencies and touch possibly on some capacities as well? Yes, 
Uh, so, you know, the, the report cites literature of researchers who've been working for quite a while to develop a framework of core competencies for sustainability in higher education. And as a committee, we thought the most valuable thing we could contribute is, is not, not need, there's no need really to change that framework, um, which we know is also evolving, but we thought it was important just to reinforce. Um, and so one of our recommendations specifies that um, in academic institutions of higher education should realize that sustainability education is, a, it's a vital field that actually requires specifically tailored experiences and the development of these core competencies and capacities. And that this should, you know, each organization, each institution basically has to sort of play to its strengths and think about the context of its overall curriculum to figure out exactly how they want to develop competencies and capacities, um, hopefully in keeping with some of these frameworks that are becoming really sort of uh, dominant um, in, the, in the discussions among uh, educators who are working in this field. But in, a, in essence, one of our messages is that there's no one size fits all for competencies and capacities, but each institution and each group that's either building one of these programs or looking to strengthen it should explicitly be mindful and figure out what package of competencies and capacities that they want to put together. And especially to think through, are you aiming for a program where the major is going to be in sustainability. So basically, it's going to be a, a very broad degree. So it's breadth of strength. And in that case, it becomes very important. Some of the competencies have to do with actually being able to navigate knowledge systems across uh, disciplines and to be able to do strategic thinking and to do futures thinking, for example, learning techniques such as scenario analysis, sort of think about future possible um, scenarios for how um, some of these problems or solutions may unfold. Uh, but the other option is that you might have a, a graduate program such as an engineering program or an ecology program where, especially if it's a graduate program where it's depth at strength, but you would like your students to um, address the issues in their field through, the, through sustainability as a lens to kind of address that. So that might mean using a slightly different assemblage of core competencies um, and capacities. Now by capacities, what we meant um, we were actually drawing on a recent paper by um, Bill Clark and a colleague, we meant the intention, ability and competence to act effectively. So the point being that um, it's one thing to learn about all these ideas in your courses, but you also have to encourage your students to develop the capacity to actually take action, which is one of the reasons why we emphasized uh, experience, experiential education so much. And we had a few boxes throughout the report that gave illustrative examples of a whole range of different kinds of experiential education programs, you know, including uh, students in a course working in a team with a local community or students spending, both undergraduates and graduates spending a summer uh, maybe with a local community to uh, programs like the one that I lead where in a two year master's degree, the entire second year, so half of their education, a student is required to be immersed with a real world partner and working on a co-design project. We we're emphasizing that because there's just so much evidence that that kind of deep experiential learning is actually how students manage to sort of really pull together what they learn um, in the classroom, pull together these interconnected competencies and help to develop their capacities. I could go on, but I think it might be better let some other people weigh in here. Now, I, I'm going to take my moderator's prerogative now and just yeah. add to that experiential learning portion and say I think exactly. that, that has been something that we've done in Los Angeles. And I would be remiss if I didn't take the chance to quote my boss, the mayor, when he likes to say that we shouldn't be future passive or future phobic. And we should, we should not just even be future possible, we should be future guiding. Right. And so the extent to which we can bring students into the experience of what we do every day in local government is something that we've made a priority here in the city of Los Angeles. And I can speak from personal experience about the program that I help lead um, implementing the sustainable development goals and capturing that agenda at the local level. We've worked with more than seven universities and more than 150 students uh, over the last three years, really bringing them into a series of very specific projects that are executing collaboration with a city client, looking specifically at problems all the way from indoor air quality and biodiversity to the distribution of federal entitlement grants uh, across communities and looking at specific issues of equity. 
And so I think that that type of experiential learning is really key. And we've had students that have stayed with us over the course of several semesters, from summer to summer, and even pursued graduate studies after undergraduate programs that, that allowed them kind of that chance to, to be exposed to the local, to local government in action, is how I'd like to say that. So let me transition that now to Lita and ask you, Lita, what could the federal government do to support this report, its findings, and overall kind of sustainability in higher education? Yeah, I think that's a, a really great question because um, it's, the federal government has actually tried to do something about uh, sustainability education in the past. Um, so those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, back in 2008, Congress actually passed something known as the Higher Education Sustainability Act uh, that was part of the Higher Education Act, uh, HEA. And the idea is that it would be um, this Higher Education Sustainability Act was a competitive grants program uh, to provide sort of uh, resources to universities so that they could develop and implement their own sustainability programs to help prepare for a sustainability workforce. Um, and unfortunately, even though it passed and was in the act, it was only actually authorized one year. Uh, but back in 2019, um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island um, sort of uh, asked for a reauthorization of the Higher Education Sustainability Act. Um, and in this reauthorization, the idea is that the competitive grants program would still happen, uh, but these grants would be handed out through the EPA. And that was actually still a continuation of the 2008 act that was passed as well. But what the committee realized is that a lot has changed in the funding environment around sustainability since 2008. And in fact, the EPA is no longer the main funder for sustainability work. And so the committee through their own research and with a staff assistant was able to actually find a lot of sustainability programs that have been supported by other federal agencies, including the National Science Foundation, NOAA, um, NIST, uh, Department of Defense even, uh, as well as several other federal agencies. And so the committee um, suggested in their work that should this uh, Higher Education Sustainability Act indeed be reauthorized, possibly through the next reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, um, that the language be modified to be inclusive of these other federal agencies, given that they are now stepping up as being major funders in sustainability science and sustainability research, um, that it would be a natural extension to include sustainability education as part of their portfolios. And then um, on top of that, um, kind of going back to some of our beginning conversations from the session about equity and diversity, um, the committee recommended that um, at least some portion of those grants also be sort of set aside to make sure that they are awarded to uh, minority serving institutions as well. Um, so that they're given, you know, uh, sort of a, I don't want to say competitive advantage, but to be able to fairly compete uh, for those grants as well. And, and, you know, I think the committee believed in this way there would be further engagement across federal agencies for sustainability education in a way that was already reflective of their changing sustainability research portfolios. So it's almost as though the, the foundation is there. It wouldn't necessarily take a major uh, or complicated lift from these agencies in order to do that. And so um, hopefully as news gets out, um, you know, as Congress is able to sort of finish up a lot of their work around pandemic relief, but this ends up being a part of those conversations as well. Um, and so for sure, we're gonna be keeping an eye on it and, and we encourage um, other folks across the country to, to look in and speak with their own uh, local policymakers about the Higher Education Sustainability Act um, and what it could possibly provide to their institutions as they try to strengthen their own programs. Thank you. Thanks, Lita. That's great. Let me go to one of our questions from the audience, um, and I'll try to give a quick answer to this and then pass it to Anne for a little more detail. But the question is, I'm interested in what you think of the role of communication disciplines in the future of sustainability programs. And I can just say, I think we highlighted that they're key, right? They're one of those capacities that are really essential to be able to communicate and um, affect change at a, at, a, at a community and kind of broader level and really engage both with uh, community and local organizations, as well as kind of the behavior that needs to be modified or the, the change that needs to be implemented. So let me pause there and pass it over to Anne to finish that question. Thank you. And right at this moment, I don't remember exactly all the places in the report that we talked about this, but the question definitely 
draws my mind to uh, our chapter, uh, which I think was about um, uh, building the workforce. And we emphasize the importance also of developing change agents um, in our students. And that section talked a lot about different capacities that these students um, need to be encouraged to develop, including uh, emotional intelligence skills, um, actually being supported in their own self-care, given that sustainable issues can be really challenging uh, and sometimes somewhat depressing given the complexity of the challenges, but communication is, is an absolutely key part of that. Uh, so, you know, my, from what I remember of some of the programs that we reviewed, and I know um, education programs I've been involved with and currently involved with, they, they often have actually explicit coursework on communication skills or communication is built into um, uh, key courses um, as a really important component. And, you know, I think the other thing that's really a great advantage is that the current generation of students are naturally gravitate actually to communication. This is the social media generation. They're used, they're used to visuals and oral communication, I think even more so than our generation of elders um, was who, you know, we were, I think, tended to emphasize more written communication. Of course, that's important, but I think this generation uh, actually has a lot of yen and drive to do very creative multimodal forms of communication. So that's a real advantage and it's something that we can, we can build upon. Um, and in, in the idea of, of developing change agents, which, which we argue um, in the latter part of the report is sort of one of the key outcomes that we want where we're training these students so that they can go out into the world and actually lead and guide on the change management that we know is needed to transform many unsustainable trends to a sustainability pathway. So clearly communication uh, skills and development needs to be a key part of that. This, in some ex to some extent, also connects to our recommendations um, under the theme about uh, developing the academic environment for this, because this means that you know, many universities or colleges have a communication department or experts in communication who might be in a department that's different than the department where the engineers and the ecologists and the natural resources and the sociologists are. So it just shows very clearly why these education programs absolutely have to be interdisciplinary and why we need to make sure that from the top leadership of the institution on down, there is encouragement and incentives to allow that kind of interdisciplinary connection. Thanks, Anne. I'm going to ask one more question that we had come in over Slido and before I transition us all to give kind of our quick one minute wrap up. And that question, which is open to everyone, and I'll, I'll take a stab at it before passing it off. The question is, what were some of the perspectives from students, including those at the workshop, that we took away as part of the, and included in the report, right, on sustainability, both as a field and a career path? And so if there's anything that stands out for you all, I'd love to hear it. I recall from our workshop in Santa Cruz, hearing a young woman talk about how sustainability became an option kind of only after they felt like someone had bounced out of pre-med, right? Where like there had been kind of a, a push outside of if you weren't gonna be really serious about kind of e either math or science or, or engineering that they is a pre-med, then you went into sustainability, which gave it a certain amount of kind of pejorative status, which I thought was a really interesting takeaway. I also thought hearing from students who had transitioned into career fields that are very different than what might be expected, again, pointing to the need for further research on the sustainability career marketplace. Someone who worked in venture capital or as a startup saying, you know, that this sustainability education was key to being able to understand where there are emerging marketplaces, emerging opportunities in the marketplace for startups and early stage investment. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective as well. So let me open it up then to the floor before we do wrap up, if you could share any, uh, anything you remember from students or in your own personal experience. Do you wanna say anything Arun? I think one, one statement I remember talking with some of the students who were uh, in the same meeting uh, that you mentioned in Santa Cruz uh, and, was uh, the, the feeling among students that uh, often what they learn about sustainability and about the job market related to sustainability and about career options comes less from faculty and more from their peers. And 
a lot of what they they find themselves uh, uh, sort of uh, tuned attuned to is thinking uh, about what kind of experience their uh, their colleagues or their cohort uh, members bring to to the field and i think that also says uh, to me that also says a lot about how we need to involve our students more closely in uh, some of the uh, some of the skills development some of the uh, building of uh, preparing them for uh, for sustainability careers, how we need to involve our own students in making that happen and uh, enabling that. And I think many of our uh, higher education institutions are already doing it, but I think there is less cross-institutional learning from alums than uh, sort of uh, learning from within the alums of, from within the institutions alums uh, 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 for the most part. and. Again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about coordination across different universities and across different schools and programs and sustainability. I mean, I often feel that we we are all engaged in the same task, same goal, which is to not just to strong to create uh, well trained or to to uh, to ensure that our students are well trained in different skills or in different areas of knowledge or in different substantive fields but also that they are able to function in, uh, in the workplace in ways that make a difference in the world. And here, I think there is really a very significant, uh, there are many significant opportunities for learning across institutions rather than being focused on primarily our own institutions, our own students and our own alums. Thanks, Arun. We have just a couple minutes left, so we're going to try to answer both one of the questions that came into Slido and then also give a quick wrap up. So I'm going to ask everyone around the horn to give me only kind of 30 to 45 seconds here. And the, the question is, what is the estimate of the proportion of institutions, two year, four year and comprehensive that currently have sustainability academic programs? And I'll just say that as a precept to this report, we identified that there was a huge growth in sustainability programs or interest around them, which was part of why we looked at this, uh, this consensus report. So I don't have a specific answer. Um, my I think there was a report, question... from, there was a report okay. on this, which identified, if I remember in 2017 or 18, which identified about 160 undergraduate degree offering programs in sustainability slash natural resources slash environment. The number of PhD granting, masters and PhD granting programs is smaller. Uh, I don't have that number right off the top of my head. Yeah, and I I'll just Arun, add, I don't, I think Arun's about right. I have a hard time remembering numbers like this. And actually our committee member who's the real expert on this is Chris Boone, who's not um, on the panel today. But we did, we drew on the analyses from what's now called the Global Council for Science and the Environment, but previously called the National Council for Science and the Environment, they have been actually doing surveys and trying to track this for quite a while. So right now that's probably the best available data. Um, but this question is actually a good example of why we recommended actually more robust research on what's happening in sustainably higher education, you know, tracking it, doing kind of longitudinal work, as well as understanding what the effects of it are, both for students and their careers and the workforce and what effects it's having um, in the institutions. All right, well, I think we ran out of time to do our quick yeah. wrap up. So let me just say a thanks to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine for their support of this report, as well as to the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation, as well as their endowment at the National Academies on Sustainability. I think if we want to leave you with anything, it's hopefully that this report is worth reading, looking into, and thinking about how you can incorporate some of these findings into your work on sustainability education, and hopefully join us in continuing this research on an important area, an emerging area for the marketplace, as well as for the future of our world. Thank you all so much for joining us, um, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any additional questions.